We gather in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. I'm Father Nathan. I'll be presiding and preaching today on this Wednesday of Easter week. I've been hearing a lot about um, when are things going to get back to normal, and um, we've been kind of warned whatever the economy is going to be, it's not just going to be flipping on a switch, that there's still some sort of uh, ambiguity to be moved through. In the gospel today, it, this gospel is often uh, proclaimed at a mass at night on Easter. The main event of Easter is first thing in the morning on, on that first day of the week, the empty tomb. But this story is at the end of the day where on the one hand, darkness was turning into light. Now light's turning back towards darkness again. But in that moment, the presence of Christ is revealed. Let's go uh, inward for a moment, ask the Holy Spirit to stir within us, show us an opportunity for growth and change, and especially for joyful hope. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. O God, who gladden us year by year with the solemnity of the Lord's resurrection, grant that by celebrating these present festivities, we'll merit through them to reach eternal joys through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter and John were going up to the temple area for the three o'clock hour of prayer. A man crippled from birth was carried and placed at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate every day to beg for alms from the people who entered the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms. But Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. He paid attention to them, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, I have neither silver nor gold but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise and walk. Then Peter took him by that right hand and raised him up. And immediately the man's feet and ankles grew strong. He leaped up, stood and walked around and went into the temple with them walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the one who used to sit begging at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with amazement and astonishment at what had happened to him. The word of the Lord. Speak God. Rejoice, O hearts that seek the Lord. Rejoice, O hearts that seek the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, invoke his name, make known among the nations his deeds. Sing to him, sing his praise, proclaim all his wondrous deeds. Rejoice, O hearts that seek the Lord. Glory in his holy name. 
Rejoice, O hearts that seek the Lord. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek to serve him constantly. Rejoice, Rejoice O, o hearts, hearts that, that seek the, the Lord. Lord. You descendants of Abraham, his servants, sons of Jacob, his chosen ones, he the Lord is our God. Throughout the earth, his judgments prevail. Rejoice, Rejoice O hearts, hearts that seek the Lord. the Lord. He remembers forever his covenant, which he made binding for a thousand generations which he entered into with Abraham and by his oath to Isaac. Rejoice, Rejoice O hearts, hearts that seek the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Sisters and brothers, the Lord be with you. This reading is from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. They were conversing about all the things that had occurred. It happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you talking about as you walk along? And they stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he asked, what sort of things? The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. How our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. We had been hoping he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it's now the third day since this took place. Some women in our group have astounded us that they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had seen a vision of angels announcing that he was alive. Some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they didn't see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophet spoke. Wasn't it necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all that referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him. Stay with us, for it's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So when he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at the table, he took bread and said the blessing. He broke it and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were open and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. 
Then they said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them. They were saying, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place along the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Sisters and brothers, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. John's gospel from which the story comes is the one that's the most theatrical of all. If you were the person who does the lighting for a stage play, all the lighting cues are right there in the text. If you pay attention to John's gospel, just with regard to light and dark, that's a beautiful way to read one of the levels of it. I mentioned at the outset of the Mass that Easter is primarily a feast that celebrates the first light of dawn, early in the morning, as the first rays of the sun are coming up. That's when the action happens at Easter. Light begins slowly to overcome the darkness, and that's when the empty tomb, and, and even when Jesus first speaks to Mary Magdalene at the tomb, she doesn't even recognize who he is. Uh, there's this dawning awareness. But then by the end, this story is, is beautiful in that it gives us the end of that first day of the week, and it's getting dark again. And a couple of the disciples are going the wrong way. They're heading away from resurrected life, and they're just heartbroken. Whenever grief enters into our lives, when someone that we love dies, it's, it's particularly hard right now because all the people who are losing loved ones to the virus, and even for other things that involve being in the hospital, loved ones can't be physically present. And then when it's time for a funeral, only 10 people get to come, or some are having to delay funeral rites at all to whenever it will be possible to gather again very mixed. It reminded me of when my father died. My dad died in 1997, but his death was preceded by years of advancing Parkinson's disease. And he slipped away from us bit by bit by bit. The last year of his life, he uh, couldn't speak. He was bedridden. He went from being more than 200 pounds to under 100. He was just this shriveled little thing. And so I was, I was praying for his death, that, it, that his suffering would end. And then when his death came, I had prayed that I would be able to rejoice on that day. Like, you know how we call Good Friday good? What in the world is good about it? Well, it just takes all the nerve in the world for Christian people to call Good Friday good. You know, to look right at death and say, this is all right. <laughs> We're going to get through this. Well... I remember my dad dying. I, was, I missed his death by half an hour, but I got there pretty quickly and I blessed his body and then got busy with all the funereal stuff because I'm the priest in the family and so there was the church to call and the mortuary and uh, you know, s starting to put together a program and music and all of that busyness around a funeral. But I was in the home that I grew up in, my parents' dream home, and people were coming in and out I don't know if you've seen this in your own, uh, the way your own family does death and, and funerals. But there would be a moment when kind of all the crying stopped. And then there were jokes or laughter. Maybe the phone rings and there's some news about somebody's plane connections. or The doorbell rings and another neighbor shows up with a casserole. Well... We hadn't seen my sisters yet. They were driving over from Houston, which was a two-hour drive away, and we'd all just been through our crying and our planning and consoling each other and so on, and I think we'd gotten to a kind of a level place, and the doorbell rang. My sisters rang the doorbell at their own house. <laughs> Who does that? They rang the doorbell at their house so that someone would come to the door. That's because 
show and tell. They each had on one of these. And they got one for everybody. They had a whole bag full of these. Because my dad was a practical joker. He even pranked his own daughter's wedding. And a lot of the storytelling began to be about Max and all the outrageous thing, pranks and things that he did. And so they showed up like this because they didn't want to start another jag of crying when they showed up. And so you might have wanted to hug each other and start crying all over again, but could you really cry when somebody's wearing one of these? Maybe to tears of laughter. Well, these poor guys in the Emmaus story, they've had their hearts broken. And just how many times do you let that happen? When your heart's already in pieces, do you dare hope for something better? They even knew that this, while they were walking away from Jerusalem downcast and sad, they even knew these accounts about the women. Some of the women in our company have come back with this story that he's alive. But somehow it didn't give them joy. It just kind of added more confusion to the mix. Whereupon secret Jesus, the Jesus they didn't recognize, stealth Jesus, says, how foolish you are and how slow to understand. And then he just starts laying it all out, bit by bit by bit. You know, the prophets and the law and whatnot. And here, don't you see that the Messiah had to suffer? And then it, it all makes sense. And then, as you know, in the story, it looks like they've reached their destination and it looks like Jesus is going to go farther. And they say the same words that were said at the beginning of the gospel when, when I think it was Andrew or some of the very, they hadn't even become followers yet, but they were intrigued by Jesus and they, they invited him, stay with us. Now at the end of the gospel, there, there's people saying the same thing. Stay with us. Don't leave us. And of course, he does stay with them. There's this table scene that evokes the table right here, Eucharistic table. He says the blessing and vanishes from their midst. I served at Stanford for seven years, and I can remember being brought into a class on Sunday morning, a Sunday school for about 10 and 11 year olds, but their parents were from Stanford and so they really probably could have been in a master's program at 10 or 11. They're, you know, they're, they're hovered over about their educations. And I just asked this question, where, where did he go? He was right there and he vanished from their sight. I just asked this group of 10 and 11 year olds, where did Jesus go? And this little 11-year-old guy came out with this. Well, Father, he went inside them. Duh. <laughs> he went. That's what we do with our food. It, it goes inside us. Uh, I've never forgotten it. Uh, well, of course, he went inside of us. And at, at that moment... Their, it said their eyes are opened and they recognized that they needed to go back the other direction. They didn't need to keep heading into deeper darkness. They need to go back toward the light even if it is sunset. Even if it is late and dark, I'm going back to Jerusalem. And, and they did and they found the 11 gathered and they heard the stories and they added their story to it. Maybe there was more crying. Maybe there was laughing or both going on at once. I think we're going to be living that this Easter season, don't you? We're not all going to be up at the same moment. And there's going to be times when we're just going to get so tired of bad news or staying indoors or whatnot. And it won't always be all of us in lockstep with each other. Maybe there might be times when we're all happy at the same time or all sad at the same time, but lots of the times one is up and the other one's down. And it might just be that for a while the presence of the Lord in our midst and in our hearts uh, is the thing that lifts us up. And especially those of us that are in ministry, people are counting on us. We can't be up every last second, but we can at least try to rise to the occasion if those around us will lift us up. So we'll move now to the Eucharistic table that we'll have to commune for you again, but, but we're up to the task, uh, if you're up to the task, of opening your heart wide and allowing the Lord to manifest inside you so that this resurrected life really can take on um, a deeper meaning in our, our, uh, our world that's just hungering for good news. So with that, let's stand.
offer a prayer or two. I'll get us started. Let's pray in this Easter season for um, joyful hope for all those who are finding this season uh, uh, difficult to live through, uh, that we could be people of joyful hope and lift each other up. For this we pray to the Lord. Let's pray for all those who were already on a search for God in their midst before all of this illness struck us, and for all those who might be now inclined to uh, be more spiritual seeker than they might otherwise, that somehow that uh, the spirit of the living God would reward their efforts. We pray to the Lord. We pray here at the University of Arizona for all of our students and our faculty and administration, everyone who's trying to figure out how to uh, run an educational organization over the internet, uh, for everybody that's uh, continuing to try to learn and advance toward the uh, degrees and careers that they came here for. For this we pray to the Lord. Lord Have you prayers that you would like to include? Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we love you, but we want to love you more and more. Hear the prayers we offer today. Answer our prayers in the way that pleases you most. For we do trust in you as we call out in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we receive the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth, the work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we receive the wine we offer you. Fruit of the vine, the work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Please pray that our sacrifice will be acceptable to God, our Almighty Father. Lord, receive the sacrifice which has redeemed the human race and be pleased to accomplish in us salvation of mind and body. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It's truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to acclaim you, Lord, but especially in this time above all, to praise you even more gloriously when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. For he is the true lamb who has taken away the sins of the world. By dying, he has destroyed our death and by rising, restored our life. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land and every people exults in your praise. Even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy indeed, Lord. You're the font of all holiness. Make holy these gifts by sending your spirit upon them like the dewfall, that they may become for us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, broke it. He gave it to his disciples, 
saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body. It will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. It's the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant. It will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. We humbly pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ will be gathered into one by your Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church spread throughout the world. Bring us to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, and Edward, our Bishop, with all the clergy and all your people. Remember, too, our brothers and sisters who've fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them all into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, with St. Thomas More, and all the saints who pleased you throughout the ages, may we merit to be co-heirs to eternal life. May we praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Let's pray now as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin and protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's offer one another some sign of Christ's peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. I will say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Let's stand now to pray. Lord, we pray that the reverent reception of the sacrament of your Son will cleanse us from our old ways and transform us into a new creation. We ask this through Christ, our Lord. And the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our Mass is ended. Let's go now in peace to love and to serve our Lord.